So let's go on to high mass stars then, and they're still our remnant options. Um, suppose we look at a very massive star. Mass is greater than 10 times that of the sun. Um, what is the heaviest element they could produce in their cores? No, this one is not a trap. So it looks like most of you are answering D, iron. Um, indeed, that is now the heaviest element that a high mass star can produce in its core. So you're going to use this flow chart that we produced in um, your activity later today. Um, but it's maybe good to you know, draw your own version of this just to kind of wrap your head around all the different branching points. So anyway, if we had a star that was um, you know, more than two solar masses, then it could get to this carbon burning place. And then for, for stars less than eight solar masses, they can produce a planetary nebula. If they're more than eight solar masses, they'll go on and produce more and more fusion. And then there's another branch point for a mass uh, more than 10 solar masses. Those stars can produce iron uh, via nuclear fusion. But if they're less than 10 solar masses, they'll go supernova before this happens. So anyway, iron is the end of the road for all high mass stars. Nothing past iron can be produced by nuclear fusion in the core of the star. And so this is how a neutron star eventually is made. So the idea, the reason that iron is the end of the road is that it takes more energy to fuse iron together than its fusion process releases. So for most other elements, um, they take some energy to fuse together, right? They, they need a high temperature to give them the kinetic energy of motion so that they can find each other, basically slam past the um, electrostatic forces holding the charged particles apart and then fuse together. And so that's okay that it takes a lot of energy to put them together because it releases more energy than it took. And so that's what's keeping um, radiation pressure built up in the core. But for iron, um, you'd have to slam it together at much higher speeds um, and the amount of kinetic energy used up there would be greater than the amount released by fusion. So it's not going to produce pressure in the core. It cannot um, help the star withstand the force of gravity. So because iron has, um, because of this situation, the fusion rate drops inside the star once iron starts to build up. This reduces the pressure and again, it, the core size is gonna go down. So we're again contracting the core of a high mass star. And the big difference between our high mass star and our low mass star is there's just a lot more mass in the core because there's a, a much larger star to begin with. The reason that it doesn't stop and also produce a white dwarf star is because the electron degeneracy pressure is too weak to hold up to the gravity. So we can overcome this electron degeneracy pressure at these extreme uh, forces of gravity and we'll produce a neutron star instead. All right, so this is kind of the step-by-step -step for how a neutron star is made. It's very similar to the white dwarf process, except it happens at a much higher density. So we've pressed past the white dwarf phase. Um, so now we're squishing electrons closer together than they want to be. And um, they don't like to do this, and so they don't do this. So instead what happens is the electrons combine with any protons in the um, atomic nuclei left in the core, and that produces neutrons and neutrinos. So our reaction equation looks like this. If you take a proton, which is a positive <clears throat> charge, and an electron, which is negative, and put them together, then you'll end up with a neutron plus a neutrino. Um, and the you know, plus plus minus gives us a neutral object. So that means that the neutron and neutrino that are produced have no charge. So this is what's happening. This is why it's called a neutron star because all of the protons in the core are being converted into neutrons. So um, the core of the star is what becomes the neutron star. Outside above the core in the rest of the star, we have our, you know, onion layers again where iron is closest to the core and then we get lighter and lighter elements, um, fusion products on the way out. And then that outer layer is still made of hydrogen. So very you know, familiar to what we've seen before, except now we've got a neutron star core. And um, a couple of other interesting happen things happen as this um, protons and electrons turn to neutrons and neutrinos, which is that some of the neutrons are expelled from the core in the process 
And these can combine with the stuff in the outer layers to produce heavier elements. Um, and then also the neutrinos are escaping. Um, they are being flung out of the inner core. Remember, they're usually not um, stopped by matter, but as we'll see in this case, they will be. All right, so we're, we're producing a neutron star core. Neutrons are being flung out to produce heavy elements. And we can kind of look at the whole periodic table now and see just how many elements are uh, produced by exploding massive stars. So that's all the ones that are highlighted in green. Um, there are multiple ways to make some of the elements. So that's why some of them have a, a few different colors. Um, and so you can see a good chunk of our periodic table uh, can only be produced in supernova explosions. And this um, you know, includes some elements that are really critical to life. So things like magnesium, sodium, um, phosphorus, these are all elements that we need in the uh, machinery of our cells in order to stay alive. And so the only reason that we can exist is because of supernova explosions. In this case, how do you suppose neutron star sizes relate to their mass? All right, it's just the same as before, actually. So the smaller the neutron star is, the more massive it is. And it's basically for the same reason. So instead of being held up by electron degeneracy pressure, now our neutron stars are held up by neutron degeneracy pressure. So it's a very similar idea that the neutrons become degenerate. They resist being squeezed more tightly together, um, but they still have some freedom to be squeezed in a narrow range. So um, eventually the, the collapsing core that reaches neutron degeneracy pressure, and this is when it's truly a neutron star. And then um, the neutron degeneracy pressure is pretty stiff. So when the, um, when all of the matter reaches that neutron degeneracy pressure, like the maximum degeneracy pressure, um, this is when catastrophe happens. The rest of the collapsing matter on the outside, all of those other layers, they basically hit a wall. Um, they just stop and they've been falling in at a very fast rate um, at a considerable fraction of the speed of light. And so there's a shock wave a very violent shock wave that is released. It breaks up the atomic nuclei in that vicinity. Um, and then basically everything goes rebounding. So it's like bouncing a huge massive ball. So all the neutrons that are um, being expelled during this process, they slam into the rest of the infalling matter. The neutrinos even react and they are um, you know, very high energy but very low mass, and usually they don't interact with anything. But in the case of a type two supernova, the matter is so dense in the vicinity of the core that they actually do interact with matter uh, and in a big way. So all of the energy from their high speeds is deposited into those layers and that contributes to the massive explosion of the type two supernova. So, um, you can, you know, watch more about this process in the crash course video on high mass stars, highly recommended. Um, and this whole process, I just want to point out the timing of this is really extreme. So the star lives for millions and millions of years um, on its way to producing iron in its core. And then as basically as soon as it has iron and it can, it, that destabilizes the entire core and the collapse process that we just discussed takes only a quarter of a second and all of the infalling matter is falling at 23% the speed of light. So this is just like mind boggling event. And then the explosion takes around a few hours and the remnants that are produced um, persist for many years and we can actually watch them evolve over time. So um, what do you suppose could go wrong if you were too nearby a supernova? Um, just take a minute and type in the chat what you think might be some of the hazards associated with it. Yep, exactly. So the radiation alone would not be good, good for us. Um, the energy, it's just massive. And so it, if you're too close, you could get just completely demolished. Um, but even if we're far away, then the radiation released by the star could still uh, tinker with the delicate systems around us that keep us alive. So our atmosphere, for example. Um, yes. 
So some of the other hazards would be the cosmic rays. So basically a cosmic ray is a massive particle like an electron or a proton, and it's moving near the speed of light. Since our supernova, um, the matter that was falling in was about 23% of the speed of light and it basically bounced. So it's still moving at a significant fraction of the speed of light. So those cosmic rays are now being generated by a supernova. We think this is the origin of most of the cosmic rays that um, bathes Earth. Um, we experience cosmic rays all the time. If you do anything like astrophotography or, um, I don't know, anything that involves electronics, cosmic rays can interfere with. And so, for example, when I was doing scientific research in physics, then I would um, have to account for the amount of cosmic rays that hits our detector when I was doing measurements um, of small levels of light, like very low light levels. Um, cosmic rays can also over time destroy computers. So um, your computer hard drive is actually, you know, the information on it is not, won't last forever because cosmic rays will come in and flip the bits and basically over time degrade the storage, the memory of that computer. Okay, so anyways, cosmic rays, usually they don't hurt us, they don't do anything to us, we can measure them. Um, but if there are too many of them at once, then they could actually interact in a bad way. Um, supernovas produce a lot of X-ray radiation, that would be a primary um, threat if you were nearby. And then the neutrinos are not so dangerous unless you're actually inside the supernova, in which case you have bigger problems. Um, so just to set your worries aside, we're basically safe unless there's a supernova within about 50 light years of us and none of the stars that are within 50 light years are massive enough to go type two. So it's not really a big concern. And the only massive star that's even within um, you know, several hundreds of light years that could go supernova is Spica. So it's 260 light years away. It's outside of our window of concern. Um, and it's about 10.3 times the mass of the sun. So it would be pretty sweet if Spica went supernova and we could observe it because it would be really nearby and we would learn a lot about supernova um, processes by being able to see one relatively close up.